Should be on. There we go. That's good. So, hello everyone, um, and welcome to a live event again. My God, it's been years. Um, so let me go back to somehow this skips ahead. Uh, my name is Patrick Fitzgerald. I'm the CEO of uh, Required Magic. Um, even though it says my shirt, I'm part of iLayer, which is another company I've got. Um, Required Magic developed carpet um, because we saw that there was a need in the market to do mass, de mass deployment of Linux. So about me, uh, sorry, I've got a very tip touchy remote control. So I've been a problem solver uh, since 1974 um, in the form of doing Lego and, and building stuff and thinking of things and having problems and, and fixing those problems when I was building. <clears throat> then I moved on to, uh, after school, I moved into working in uh, film, um, in computer, in uh, special effects, which was not computerized special effects, it was physical, wind, rain, fire, all those things, and that's a, a, a massive um, problem-solving environment, because the director says, well, the script says one thing, and you have to work out how that goes ahead, goes together, and how you're going to present it, and even how... What, what angles are, they going to, are going to be presented to the camera. Um, and there's a, there's a great line in, uh, in, in script writing where you say, where it's just, it's called, and then World War II happened in the script. And then you have to think, how big's the budget for this thing? <laughs> how, many, how many war scenes are you going to show? Or, or is it just, uh, you know, so you have to go through that and, and, and but do all the budget and then take that back to the producer and and they'll say, no, we don't have enough money to do that. So you have to come up with creative, creative solutions. <clears throat> so that was all in Australia. Um, there was a glut in the film industry. Um, so someone said they should get into technology, and that's where I've stayed ever since. Um, so currently, um, fast forward 25 years or more, um, we're an MSP for cloud solutions. Uh, we've got uh, locations in, in London, um, in um, Zurich, in Germany, um, and South Africa. Um, we provide cloud systems, uh, all of which are, are based on Linux with KVM. Um, and during one of our consulting uh, engagements, we needed to work with a, a, a homegrown deployment system, which then led to this, this application called Car Carpet. <coughs> um, Carpet was formerly known as Snoop here, and I didn't like that, that name either. Um, but it leverages Active Directory and MQTT, if you're familiar with that, which is a, a, a messaging and, and um, queuing, message queuing system, and templating, templating technology to produce a manageable uh, install system uh, across a wide area network, which is quite important. Um, so we can remote, uh, re we can deploy rem uh, Linux images or I Linux, Linux installed environments remotely. So there's a bit of a difference between. So it's, it's not a dumb imaging tool or even a smart one, uh, although it could be because it's got, um, it does a live install using the native installer, using a scripted, a scripted environment, um, which, is, can be, which can be specific even down to the individual workstation. So you can have groups of, of uh, users, for example, in a, in a, an example would be a bank where you've got tellers and you've got back office workers and you know, whatever, you might have a bunch of uh, teller systems, bank, like physical bank teller systems that you, with a human sitting in front of them um, with a specific build of software that they need to have, but they don't need anything else except maybe printing or maybe not even printing. You might want to have the, uh, the USB ports locked off, for example. Um, so we could do that and the other part of the other part of of the bank, there might be another requirement for another thing. For example, although th these are usually managed by, um, by outsourced, uh, outsourced companies, but 
automatic teller machines. You could, have, you could use our environment to deploy software onto those boxes. <clears throat> um, and we use the, the native Linux installer because that does all the hardware detection on the local machine, which is, in my view, better than using a, um, a, a, an image which may be subject to change and failure depending on the hardware it's, it's deployed onto. <clears throat> um, what it's not is the cure for cancer, unless you think Windows is a cancer, in which case this is the cure. I just saw that then. Um, so why would you use it? Um, and and what, did you, what would you use it on? I mean, the use cases are as, as interesting and as broad as you'd like, actually would, you can think. Um, so we originally started using it with enterprise and Linux workstations for our bank. Um, digital signage, I mean, how many times have you walked past a, a, a digital signage location where you've seen the Windows logo floating around, not displaying any signage, unless it's a Microsoft ad. Um, VDI endpoint management, which we can, we can go to a bit later on. Um, deployment of, in fact, there's something else, is deploying um, mobile workloads uh, as virtual machines onto your, onto your, um, on your workstation estate. Um, so they could happen in the background running your virtual environments in the background and reporting back to your server infrastructure whilst the user just goes on doing their their day-to-day -day task. <clears throat> um, it also is very good at WAN um, deployment. Uh, we're working with a customer at the moment that uh, they've got, they're in Fluid Dynamics, they have Fluid Dynamics software and they're building, they're, they're extremely distributed. They've got single user um, in, in about, I think they've got about 50 staff at the moment, um, and I think at least half of those are, are just working from home um, with a high performance workstation. Um, and they now want to use VMs to virtual machines to, to build their, their own software. Um, so that we're, we're working with them to deploy um, the VM images across across the wide area network. <clears throat> you could deploy it to automotive automotive systems or Internet of Things systems. You know anywhere where you want to have Linux, it, it'll it'll work so long as um, there are some some requirements. Um, obviously, you're going to need a network, but it doesn't have to be a multi gigabit or even a, a multi hundred, um, multi, even, not even a multi um, megabit. Uh, network uh, we've deployed across uh, old bank networks with 256k of bandwidth, and we've done that uh, repeatedly um, every every two weeks for an entire estate of you know in the branch of 10 different 10 machines or 20 machines. Um, you're going to need Pixie Boot because that's how we do the initial system load. Um, Wake on LAN is nice to have if you've, if you've got it, but not essential unless you want to do stuff where you wake up systems to do updates in the middle of the night, which is usually actually what you need. Um, and DHCP, which is an, an essential, um, you might not think that, you might think that that's actually standard and it will, is on every network, but actually we've run a, we've gone into environments where everyone has had a fixed IP address, but even worse, They've had public IP addresses. We couldn't use their systems. It was a, a university, actually, and they had something stupid like 10,000 public IP addresses, and they would allocate them by hand to each um, student when they arrived. <laughs> and it, would be, it was all recorded in a spreadsheet. Um, and what made that worse is that every single department had their own IT team. So it was, yeah, that. That was an interesting um, environment. So, um, yeah, DHCP as well, because we need to be able to do some interesting things to, to detect machines and then pass on to the various uh, DHCP options. Um, but, you know, the, what problems are we trying to solve here? Um, I mean, one of them is, is that, you know, the, 
how do, how do you deploy en masse across a wide area network, or even a local area network in the same building? Um, if you deploy, we can, with, with, with carpet, you can deploy overnight, which would take months of manual network, of manual work. Um, for example, if uh, there's an example that comes later, uh, 7,500 um, bank machines uh, for Allied Irish Bank. If we had a team of eight people um, and we averaged, say, two workstations a day per, per team member, um, which may seem sound excessive, but Allied, Allied Irish Bank have 900 branches spread across Ireland, so probably two machines a day on average is probably uh, not enough. It's probably, you probably get one and a half with travel time, etc. cetera. Um, but that number of machines, eight, eight machines a day each with eight people, will take two and a half years, or less than, slightly less than two and a half years to do that deployment. And then you have to start again. Because, because of hardware or whatever. Um, uh, but even worse, if your, if your so-called workstation uh, or your Linux environment is contained inside a single board computer in a cell tower, cell phone tower or something like that, it's, you know, it's, it's excessively, it becomes even more and more expensive. Um, and this is a scenario we had. So, Seven and a half thousand desktops, 900 branches. Um, we ended up, then they were working with a team of about eight people. Um, we ended up by streamlining how they did it um, to just two people managing that number of workstations. And that wasn't the end user software environment, that was just the uh, management of the machines and the management of the operating system image on top. Um, if they had things such as uh, a hard a software issue, they could just press whatever the, the button is, the function key at boot time to do a reload and they'd have a machine just as good as new within 45 minutes. Um, if it was, and but that, if that didn't work, then it was quite clear the machine just had damage and wasn't going to ever boot, so we just chucked that out and they'd always had a, a replacement machine inside the office. Um, and that actually, that project was to remove, was replace one one flavour of Linux with another, because the estate itself was something back in some very old machines, and they would have um, the existing Linux image uh, wasn't fitting fitting properly, wasn't they were running out of memory, running out of disk space, um, so they had to go to a more compact version. Um, so there we go, yeah, so we did that, we were upgrading and updating every second week um, in line with the, in, with the internal applications team, they'll, be a, they'll do a release at the end of one week, we'd do testing across the different hardware um, form factors that they had, um, and then we'd release the following, the following weekend. Um, the lowest branch uh, bandwidth was 256k. Um, and we did all this with zero site visits. We never have been inside to the back of a AIB branch. We did it all from the glorious basement of the main office. Um, so yeah, that was great. We, we, we uh, managed that for about two years. Um, but it was really interesting. We learnt a lot. But then we thought that despite what everyone thinks, Linux is never going to be on the desktop. Now, I'm running it on my machine. I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, but you know, maybe it's never going to happen until, and we're just sort of packing all that, all that away. And then we've got another phone call from another bank, much larger, with 20,000 desktops in the UK alone. So I thought, can we make this whole application, this whole environment, can we replicate it? We got permission of, of AIB, and they said, fine. So. Yeah, everything that the AIB project was working on, working on was based on Perl. I don't read Perl. I never want to read Perl. I've read Assembler and that, I've written Assembler and that's easier. Um, uh, so, but the, the, the key takeaway, or the key points were, they used Pixie Boot to start the install. 
they scripted the install um, and they used LDAP to manage the instances inside, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the, each branch got its own node inside the LDAP or its own um, CN or whatever it is. Um, it's, it's, so each branch got that and you could actually look through the machines where with the ones that have been updated, which ones there weren't, where the, what version they were at, etc. <coughs> But doing it from a command line is just, I mean, how much consulting was that going to take? Um, so we thought we'll do a graphical front end and we started building something in uh, Django and Postgres and we thought message queuing and, and so, yeah, it was great. It was all coming together quite nicely, but really it ended up being a bit like that, which I um, thought, right, so there has to be a way to make this work possibly, properly, in a way that everyone could use it. <coughs> Um, the scope of the, of the project was, was, you know, as we started scoping it out, it, it became a very much, uh, and then World War, hap World War II happened kind of scenario in a, in a script. So, you know, we needed, we realised we needed multiple, multiple servers, we needed to be able to connect to various uh, components inside the, the client site, um, you know, four servers minimum, and days or even weeks of consulting time just to get all set up, which of course reduces the market. Tremendously, because hardly, if you're a co company with uh, with uh, 2,000 people, it's almost not worthwhile doing all that work just to do an update. So we re-architected. Um, we thought well, we have to get everything installed you know, easily and quickly. Uh, we moved a lot of operations to the cloud, um, and cut the number of virtual machines or physical. It was we could have been a physical machine, but we decided to take it and make it a, a virtual machine. So that all became one machine uh, in the client site, and everything else is in the cloud. Um, and that reduced the installation consulting time to, to one or two days or three days. It's, it's vastly reduced. Um, uh, so the new architecture was multi-tenant uh, Postgres, um, Django web, so web, user, web, uh, web website, um, message queuing from MQTT, which um, some of you may be familiar with, a very lightweight messaging um, system, queuing system. Um, this virtual machine did everything, so it provided um, an SSL, not SSH, an SSL VPN uh, to the cloud. Um, it integrated with the local network. Uh, it handled the Pixie boot, a web proxy to, to talk to certain servers in, in, in our cloud system, um, and a whole bunch of other things as well, um, but it's still quite compact. Um, all deployed systems are automatically joined to LDAP or well, preferably Active Directory, because that's where everyone, that seems to be what most people are using for management purposes, just like the, uh, the IRB uh, system. Um, the on-site uh, VM was built with a, a tool called Kiwi, which is, um, is in the OpenSUSE project, uh, and it's a, it's, um, a Python-based uh, machine builder you script it with, uh, uh, with an XML file, which is your sample of in a second, um, and you just have an overlay of the, sp of the client or the specific options you want on that machine, and it just builds it and spits it out in whatever format you want, um, either a physical machine or... Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, but there's a the type of uh, file format, the, the, op the file system, all that is built, the f file size. Um, and that, in our environment, we have built a, a front end where we, we put all the details in, in the uh, install uh, for, this, for, this for this system um, into a web wizard that just builds it and then spits it out and then that can get a, a installed on the virtual environment inside the, the client. Um, that's what it looks like. There's still some, uh, some uh, remnants of uh, the Snoopier um, name in there. <clears throat> but we've just got here um, different things. This is kind of the status screen. Um, so 
the dashboard of uh, how many systems, um, how many are up to date, um, um, how many are managed, how many are updating, um, if the network and the, and the, uh, is connected properly, and they all have different uh, you know, components that give you more information. Um, you can just press a button there and it will get a list of the, all that nodes that are, that are eligible for upgrade or need to be uh, replaced, for example, from a Windows system to a Linux system. We could do that with just adding a MAC address and they press the... Uh, in fact, if they've got Wake on LAN enabled on their system, then we can just say shut it down and wake, wake it up and 20 minutes later it becomes a Linux machine. But there were still problems. Um, so this single uh, VM uh, still required a level of on-site re uh, consulting to do, uh, to install and, and have running properly. Um, there was a big problem that we've come across now, uh, having done this a number of times, where the identity teams, the, um, the networking teams, the end user computer teams just don't cooperate or are not interested in cooperating and uh, become an obstacle. You know, a lot of the times we'd, we'd have organize, we'd organize in meetings with all of them because every single part of that, those teams need to be involved because you're trying to change the end user operating system, which is a different group of people in a large enterprise than a, a, a server operating system team. So whilst we knew that was uh, we began, we realised now that was a problem. We still had to get past that problem by doing something else and make everything else easier to, easier to manage. Um, that's the high level de description of the system. This is a bit of an out, out of place uh, slide. Um, that's what we have in the cloud it's, uh, it's, and that's uh, the uh, S SSL VPN connection to an open VPN server and open, open VPN cloud on this side. Um, there's a, what we call, um, there's a different name for it now, it was called Snoopy or Snip Sync. That's the virtual machine. Oh, I hate that. Right, okay, here we go. Sorry about this. Um, let's just go through it. Yeah, so that's you know, a, a rough approximation of how it all works. But it talks to Active Directory, and Active Directory gets sort of uh, all sorts of information as to the machine. Some of it we, comes um, standard from being from the machine being joined to Active Directory. Um, other parts we insert uh, more information um, just to, to identify it to our systems. Um, so, given all that. You know the hassle of trying to how to how to set it all up and have on-site consulting. Um, we took some of the inspiration from an online bank um, and made it a wizard-based install. So it, so the customer could do it, and in the process we discovered a, a, another product called Cage, which is another open-source product, and that is a single. It's a single window GUI, so you can run a GUI, you make your GUI a, a web browser or another application or even a, a, an RDP environment. So the, the Windows system ends up being um, just what you want it to look like without the, without the terminal or without the, uh, the complexity of the, of the GUI that you normally get. So instead of having something like that on our on our sync pro, uh, server, we could have something more. Hello. Okay. We get something more like that, which is tells the either the installer or the instructor the um, instructs the. Uh, the person is installing the server well, that might not be us because we don't have access to the, the client's um, virtual environment, that there's a few things going on. Um, and in the situation where you don't have, you do have a connection to the internet, then you could have uh, push messages. So if people are looking at that terminal, they know that there's a problem and then they don't need to call us. Um, it makes, so all this makes possible things like, um, 
we've got the the previous environment running on a on a several uh, virtual on several client machines, and all they do is pop up um, Vert Viewer, and that Vert Viewer instance talks to a virtual machine in a KVM environment. So then you actually have a, a, a form of uh, a VDI, <coughs> um, and with through full pass through of of, UDIS, of a USB and other things. Um, there are other, there's a whole bunch of use cases and, and tools that we've developed, and one of them is Weaver, which is um, let's see, um, it, disc it so it boots on into the memory of the system. It does a network discovery. Um, it also detects uh, what hardware is running underneath it. Um, and typically we'd run this uh, as a, as a, on every single machine uh, as a, like, you know, what's out there and what is the system, and then it reports everything it finds back to, the, back to our server. Um, so it does everything without touching the hard disk, or the regular disk, so, or the hard disk. So then once it, uh, it does that, it reboots and it goes back to being a Windows workstation or whatever it was there before. Um, we've got another product we, we've built called uh, Floorboard, which is very similar. Um, it, uh, it does what I was saying before. It do, does Pixie Boot um, and has Spice Accelerator in front end to run KVM machines or whatever. Whatever, whatever you get in this, and these are just the base, base units that we've, we've, we've played around with. Um, that's the sync um, program, uh, the, the, the sync virtual server, um, which I've already discussed. Um, there's an agent uh, that we can put on the deployed system, which then does acti actively collects health system health information, allows uh, just a greater deal of a greater degree of uh, flexibility uh, for the workstations. Um, we built, we discovered this other tool, which is called Nootka. It's a Python compiler. It's quite amazing. Um, it compiles Python to C, and then, and then compiles that as regular C into a binary that ends up being a lot faster and a lot more flexible, a lot faster. Um, and we develop, we build that to do the agents, the agents and the and the system, the sync system. Um, it also means you can just install it onto any system that's not dependent on the Python instance, because it's all it builds all that into into your system, into the uh, into the binary. And that is actually where I am. I think we're done. Good. Any questions? Um, so it, at, at the end, at the client workstation level with the Linux system, we use SSD, which uses um, Kerberos, does everything that a Windows machine does to join AD, and we once that is working with a little bit of configuration, uh, that that just works. Um, but if you've got a problem doing that, I, I'm I'm here for today and tomorrow. I can help. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. We've never we haven't come across that. Um, what kind of use case are you are you looking at? Okay. Again, well, you know, grab me and we can discuss later. Okay. All right. If there's no other questions, or if there are any other questions, I'm outside. So, thank you very much.